is Professor David Jamison. I'm the head of school. Uh, let me just uh, go back in time a little. Uh, the first head of school uh, was appointed here in 1882, Professor Henry Andrews. I'm going to come back to this date, 1882, in a moment. Uh, but first of all, I want to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Professor uh, Stuart Wright, uh, my colleague in the Astrophysics Research Group here in the school. Uh, Stuart is one of Australia's most productive and uh, influential uh, physicists in the field of astrophysics. Uh, he did his PhD here, but then spent a substantial period of time at the leading universities in the United States, Harvard and Princeton universities on his uh, postdoctoral fellowships. Uh, he, uh, his accomplishments in the field of astrophysics have been uh, rewarded by a swag of medals, too many to mention, but just some highlights, the Pawsey Medal of the Australian Academy of Science, the Edgeworth David Medal of the Royal Society of New South Wales, and the David Sign Prize for Research. And he presently holds an Australian Research Council Queen Elizabeth II Fellowship. Uh, his work on the early universe uh, has been extremely influential in the development of the uh, Murchison Wide Field Array, radio telescope in Western Australia, which is a vital precursor, uh, hopefully, to the Square Kilometre Array, which we're hoping to win for Australia in the very near future, which will be one of the biggest science projects of the 21st century, probing important questions about the origin and evolution of our universe. Um, Stuart's accomplishments, his distinguished accomplishments, uh, saw him promoted uh, at the beginning of this year to a full professorial chair of physics. And indeed, looking back over the long history of our school to uh, uh, Professor Henry David, the first year in 1882, I believe Stuart has the distinction of being the youngest ever uh, chair of physics in the history of our school. So it's with great pleasure that I invite Stuart to the stage for the July Lectures night. Good evening everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the second in, in our series of lectures this year. I want to talk tonight uh, about lasers in astronomy. Um, which was the title of the talk, and that's a big topic, um, and so I've, I'm going to restrict myself mostly to black holes. Uh, I think, personally, I find black holes to be one of the most interesting things we, we deal with in astrophysics, um, and there are some really interesting connections between uh, the, the invention of the laser and our, what we've learned about black holes and what we will learn about black holes over the next decade or two. I should begin... Uh, with, uh, as with my credentials to standing up here to talk about lasers. So I'm, I'm a theoretical cosmologist from New South Wales, and so I abide by New South Wales law. And in New South Wales, I'm allowed to hold and operate a laser as long as I have a, a, a reasonable excuse, and the reasonable excuse is an astronomer, or someone who uses <laughs> lectures in astronomy. <laughs> okay. So let me talk for a few minutes about black holes before we, we get to the laser. On the left here is a, um, a little animation of our solar system, the sun. Uh, the sun is, is here in the middle, and the planets are, uh, are turning around there, and I'll just go and make it start again. Okay. What you, I don't, this is just the orbits we're used to seeing, but what I want you to notice here is that the planets in the middle move faster than and the Jupiters and Neptunes out further. Okay, and this is, a, this is something called Keplerian rotation. If you have a mass, which is a point, uh, then the further you move away from that object, your, things, your orbiting bodies move slower. If you now look on the right, this is an image at the moment of the of, of this very centre of our galaxy. Okay, this central uh, ten light days shown by this bar, and for this is about a quarter of a light day here in the solar system for scale. Okay, so this is something which is not different in scale to our solar system, but you can see many stars. Okay. So we play this movie, you see this is a, a movie um, which is a representation of images that astronomers uh, from Max Planck predominantly 
took over a period of around 10 years, starting in the early 90s. And what's, what's unusual about this sequence of images is the stars are moving, okay? And, and they're moving fast, okay? And here's a fast 10 light, 10 light days here. And in a period of 10 years, these stars have moved a substantial distance. So these are stars moving at a good fraction of the speed of light. And so the question is, what, why are these stars moving like this? And in particular, you look at this one star, which at the end, which traces out this orbit here. This is a closed orbit around nothing in particular. And this is our best evidence that we have for the existence of black holes. If you go through the mathematics of what, what must lie in the middle of this image, it weighs something in the order of two million solar masses, so two million times the mass of our sun. But there's nothing there, nothing that we can see directly. So what is a black hole? The easiest way I find to think about the black hole is, is if I, suppose I'm standing on the earth and I throw a ball up in the air, it'll come back. If I throw it harder, it'll go further. And if I throw it hard enough, it won't come back at all. And that's something called the escape velocity. Suppose I then take my earth, keep the mass, but I shrink it to a smaller size. If I want the ball to escape, I'm going to have to throw it harder the, the smaller and denser I make the earth. And at some point I'll make the earth so dense that I have to throw the ball at the speed of light in order for it to escape. And that's an, an analogy, it's not exactly uh, how we understand black holes in general relativity. But if I get to something that's so dense that, that I have to move something at the speed of light in order for it to escape, that's what we refer to as a black hole. Now I can't see a black hole because nothing can go faster than light. And so if I have my, uh, my light leaving the surface of this uh, black hole, it can never escape to infinity, and so I can't observe it. So these are very dense objects. If I, if I, this is the expression uh, for the black hole, but for something the mass of a sun, you look, you're talking about three kilometers, very, very small body. And so in the middle of our galaxy, if I, I have this object, which is very much smaller than our solar system, but weighing millions of the times the mass of our sun, it can really fit into that small area. So how do we see something that's dark? This is a, uh, a diagram uh, describing how we look at where the mass lies in our galaxy. And it's, it's illustrative to, to understand uh, how we can look at the mass of the black hole. So this is a picture of a galaxy, much like our own. And uh, we would sit around here in this galaxy, our sun, at about 10 kiloparsecs from the centre. And this graph shows the velocity with which stars are orbiting this galaxy in kilometres per second versus the radius uh, here in light years. Now, if all of the mass were in this, were these visible stars that we see, then we would expect as we move out that the speed would, would rise. That's what Newton's gravity tells us. But as we move further and further away, these stars will orbit more slowly than they do closer in, just like they do in the solar system. But that's not what we observe. When we look at little bodies that sit very far away from the middle, we see that they maintain this high velocity of about 200 kilometers per second, out as far as we can see. And this is interpreted as evidence for dark matter. In fact, if you, if you look at these velocities, you require about 90% of the mass of our galaxy to lie far beyond where these stars are and to be dark, uh, to be not interacting with anything except via gravity. And this was the evidence for dark matter that's been around since uh, early last century. But, it's, but, it, but these velocities of things moving in, under the influence of gravity of dense, massive objects that we, that we can't see is how, how we can probe the black holes. So here's this little movie again for reference. And in this graph here, what's shown is, is the radius in parsecs now. And our solar system is about this scale. Okay, so we're looking at very small regions when we look at this picture. And here, one data point for each of the stars in this picture, and going to ever smaller and smaller distances from this, from this red square, which is the position of this black hole. Okay. And what you see is that as you get closer in, no matter what radius you're at, you find that there's the same amount of mass enclosed within the orbit. That's and that means that as you get closer and closer, the velocity is going up rising very rapidly in the same way as it does in the solar system, telling you that it, at the zero radius there's something very dense and massive. 
This is the Milky Way. If you go out in the night sky and it's very dark, you can see this. Um, this is a, obviously a, an, an image taken with, uh, with a camera. It's not something you can quite see with the naked eye. But the, this, black, this black hole sits in there. You can see in the night sky where, where it is. It's the, it's the brightest part of the Milky Way. And what you're looking at when you, when you look at the Milky Way is this disk of stars in our galaxy. You're looking through the disk, and that's why you see this... Uh, this kind of cloudy looking thing, you're seeing many, many stars that you can't resolve. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, unfortunately, you're looking towards the outside of the galaxy, it's not as spectacular. But for us, we get to look right into the middle and see this. Now, the, the disk of the galaxy looks the way it does because there are stars being born. And where stars are being born, there's lots of molecular material, which astronomers call dust, out of which the stars <laughs> form. And dust has an annoying property for astronomers that you can't really look through it. It absorbs the light from behind. So if you want to study the, this black hole right in the middle of the galaxy, you need to look through this dust. Okay. Now I sit in the physics department and I hear physicists talking in the corridor. And so if faced with a problem like this, you need to look something small that's covered in a lot of stuff. And a oh, let, me, let me go back for a second. Okay, um, this, is, this is an image of the centre of the galaxy. We're now zooming in uh, to, a, to about 200 light years along this bar, okay? Um, and you can see this is all this, all this very dense dust and there's various supernovae and other things going on. And you want to zoom right into the middle. So what would an astronomer do? An astronomer would shoot it, well, sorry, a physicist would shoot it uh, with a laser, okay, to try and blow out all this stuff up get rid of it. An astronomer is more subtle than that, and that's not what this laser is for. I'm going to now try in the next few minutes to describe why there is a laser shoot, this is not a photoshopped image, why there is a laser shooting out of this, uh, this telescope. If I, if I take a light, a laser beam in particular, which is has, has coherent, and I shine it through a small hole in a, in a card, this piece of cardboard, I get a diffraction pattern on a screen, and I can, which has a bright central spot and then it has rings. Or if I shine it through a slit, I will see a bright central uh, patch and I'll see some little wings on the side here. Okay, and this is diffraction. And the thinner I make the slit, the wider this patch will get. <coughs> and it's the same for a telescope. A telescope is is an aperture that the light shines into. If the telescope is, is very small, it diffracts the light into a large spot. If the telescope gets bigger and bigger, the central spot gets smaller and smaller. And so over the years, people have wanted to look at smaller and smaller things, and they've made their telescopes uh, larger and larger. This is an example of, of what you would see through a telescope, a fairly small telescope, so that you see, a, look at a star, it looks has this bright central patch, but it also has these rings. And the size of the angle of this image that you see depends on how big your telescope is. The bigger the telescope, the smaller the size of the spot. So last year um, was an important anniversary for Galileo's telescopes, and here's an example of one of them. And these telescopes had sizes of one to two centimetres, much bigger than the eye, so they were a very big improvement on what you could see, um, but quite small, and their angular resolution was a couple of thousandths of a degree. Now, if we look at that image of the galactic centre, the scale of interest is much smaller than that, a few by 10 to the minus five degrees. And so if you look at the galactic centre with your, with your two centimetre telescope, all of that detail of the orbiting stars is lost. It's just one big blur because of the diffraction of the light coming through the small telescope. Astronomers now talk about building the giant Magellan Telescope. Australia is a partner in this uh, facility. It's already bits of it are under construction. Um, and it, it's just going to be built on a 10-year time scale. And this telescope will have a diameter of 22 metres, and so an angular resolution of about a millionth of a degree, much smaller than than the scale that you need to study these things. <coughs> now, when I go to pick up my kids, uh, they often, you often hear them talking about 
the fact that this is not uh, this resolution is not something that you can utilize on the ground because because of the turbulent atmosphere and the change in refractive index with time along the lines of sight to different stars. This is you can see this when you go outside at night. A bright star looks like it's moving around, it's twinkling, and that's because the image is moving around as it as it comes down through the atmosphere. Uh, it's it's moving through. Uh, parts of the atmosphere that have different refractive index, different temperature, and that, that's changing with time. So that, so that this, a, a photon that's coming from a star really does move through the atmosphere as it comes. And this is a, some sort of time-lapse photography of, a, of some objects, and you can see they're moving around. And what that means for, a, when you look outside a bright star, you see a twinkle, but if you're taking a long image of a faint object, what if this object moves around on your detector and it makes it a big blurry object. Okay? You, you can't utilize this very high precision that you can in principle get out of your telescope because the image itself is moving around on your detector. This has been overcome with the Hubble Space Telescope by going beyond the atmosphere and although this telescope is quite small by the standard of the very large telescopes, the Keck Telescope and the Gemini Telescopes and so on, it's only two meters across, it's beyond the atmosphere, and so it doesn't suffer from, from these atmospheric effects. It can utilize its full diffraction limit. And this is why the Hubble has been able to take such, such detailed images of, the, of distant galaxies and star forming regions and so on. So, why build a very large telescope? There are two reasons. One, you get more photons. Um, but you, you really do want to get this this extra resolution. The, the Hubble can't do everything. It doesn't have enough resolution for many applications. And so you have to overcome this atmospheric problem somehow. So this diagram shows uh, how this is done. So here's a, here's a typical telescope. So light comes in, bounces off a mirror at the back, a little mirror at the front, and then it comes out through the back where the eyepiece is here. So this is a schematic uh, diagram of this. So our light's coming in, hits the secondary mirror here, and then it comes through to where the science instruments are. But some of this light is split off to a second camera over here. And the job of this camera is to, is to look at what's coming in. Now, because the atmosphere is, is moving the image of a star around, making it, it twinkle, then the wave front that it sees is not flat. It doesn't see a perfect image of this star. But it can calculate, it knows that the image should be a perfect little dot. And so it takes pictures at very high cadence, many per second, and it uses a computer to calculate what this mirror should look like in order to correct for this atmosphere. And so it sends a signal back to this mirror, and this mirror is deformable. It can have its shape change slightly in order to correct for the fact that the light coming through the atmosphere is no longer a plane wave light from different parts of the, in different directions are arriving at different times. And this is one of these things that it's hard to believe that it can work, personally, uh, but it does. Um, here's a, this is a, 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 one of these deformable mirrors. It sits at the secondary focus of this, the multi-mirror telescope. You can see the, the multi-mirrors here. This is a big telescope, uh, nearly 10 metres across, with a big mirror here, more than a meter across, with all of these little uh, deforming pistons which, which change the shape of the mirror slightly, many times per second, in order to correct for this effect. Here's a, this is an animation that shows how this works. If you look at a picture of a star through the turbulent atmosphere, what you see is, is something that looks like this, okay? not, a, not a point that you expect. And it's because the, because the turbulent atmosphere is taking this plane wave and it's changing it into something that's very bumpy. So this is a representation, the amplitude is of, of the wave front, it's bumpy, it's not flat. And this is what the mirror is deformed into in response to this. So the telescope camera at the back of the telescope measures this. It tells the mirror it should change to this shape. And this shape converts the wave front back into something which is flat. And so instead of seeing this image, you see this image of a star with a small point and these little rings. 
And so this is a, a diffraction limited image. It's, a, it's showing something with an angular scale which is set by the diameter of the telescope, not by the turbulent atmosphere. And this is implemented now on most of the large telescopes in the world. It gives you images like this. This is, this is the bright star which has been used to, to make this correction on the mirror. And here are two brown dwarfs, uh, a binary pair of brown dwarfs not associated with this star. Um, and these cannot be studied in the absence of this bright star which can, which can achieve, get the telescope to achieve its, its theoretical resolution. So this is called adaptive optics. Um, and its, its main limitation is that this thing you want to study has to be right next to some giant bright star like this. And the whole sky is not, the sky is not full of these bright stars, only some small fraction, uh, uh, only small, small fraction of the sky is accessible to this technique. So if your object is a galaxy uh, which doesn't happen to lie near a bright star, you can't use this. So you, you have to make your own stars. And this is where the lasers come in. So this laser, sodium laser, sticking out of the, the very large telescope, which you can't see, I don't think. Um, so these are the very large telescopes, the VLTs, and this is the, a sodium laser pointing towards the center of the, the galaxy. And these lasers produce a 12 watts of continuous power as part of the, uh, this laser guide star system. So the laser goes into the upper atmosphere at about 100 kilometers, it, the sodium atoms in the atmosphere at that altitude fluoresce, and so the laser, the laser beam is not reflected back to you, but you can see a bright spot in the upper atmosphere that this, this laser beam causes. And this looks like a bright artificial star, and so you can put this laser wherever you want, right next to the object you want to study, and do adaptive optics uh, with, this, with this laser guide star. This is an example of these images. So this is an image of the galactic center. This is uh, an image using a natural guide star, and here's one using a laser guide star. And you can see that um, the laser guide star image is, is as good or better than the one which, where it's not used. You can see here these stars have these little diffraction rings saying that, that this telescope has achieved the maximum resolution it can possibly achieve. <coughs> Now, the, this laser guide star has some limitation. It's, the star is not an infinity like a real star, it's at 100 kilometers. And so, it's not probing the whole atmosphere. It's only probing part of the atmosphere. Also, if, you, if, you look at a, if you're looking at a real guide star, then, then the cone that, if you think of the, the telescope as forming the base of the cone, and the star forming the tip of the cone, that cone is basically has parallel sides. Whereas if you're looking at your guide star, the cone is a real cone. It's pointy. Okay. And so the volume of air that the adaptive optics correction is being done on is not the same for the artificial star as it is for the real one. And this provides this is a limitation on, on how much area of the sky you can do your adaptive optics on in one image. And this problem gets worse as your telescope gets bigger because the guide star is still at 100 kilometers, but the base of your cone has gotten wider, and so the volume has gotten less and less like a cylinder. So the solution to this, which is not yet implemented, uh, but work is, is ongoing, is to have many guide stars, many laser guide stars, and use them in tandem to, to correct over a whole volume of atmosphere, not just the cone surrounding this one laser beam. This is an example of how this would work. Um, here, are, this, is a, this is the area you want to study, and there's a ring of these six lasers, and here is this, an image of a galaxy with lots of little star-forming regions that you would like to, to look at. Is the, uh, this is the bit of the, one of the laser beams imaged here. And so this is a simulation of how a giant Magellan telescope would view this galaxy with this uh, many laser adaptive optics implemented. Okay, so I've talked for some period of time without mentioning what a laser is. A lot of you, some, many of you will have come to David's talk last week um, and heard a lot about lasers. I just want to say a few words um, which are important for the next topics. So, 
Laser stands for light amplification by a stimulated emission of radiation. And I put microwave in here because, um, because what they can, lasers don't have to be in this optical, they can be in the microwave regime as well. And so the idea here is that we have... Uh, well, so these, these, the lasers or masers are, are much more intense radiation than other light sources. And that's... Um, it's because of the amplification of the light through a medium, which I'll mention in a minute. And it's also because the photons are not being uh, emitted in all directions as they are from a normal light source, but they're being emitted in all in one direction. So that you don't lose uh, the energy distributed over all angles. And this amplified light can be strong enough to cut through granite, like in an industrial application, or to be seen from, from billions of light years away uh, in, gently, in naturally occurring mazes in the universe. Okay, so lasers work because of a phenomenon known as population inversion. So every electron in, in a system has a particular energy, um, and they can be in low energy state or high energy state. And they, generally speaking, an electron would prefer to be in a low energy state, but under the right conditions, all the electrons can find themselves in the high energy state. And if you can, if you can produce that situation, then you have something known as a population inversion which is shown here schematically on the right. And this can, be called, this can be occur because of collisions between uh, your material and other particles, electric fields, absorption of light, uh, are things that can lead to this population inversion. Now the important thing about the inverted population of photons is that if you have uh, one photon emitted from a decay, then in this inverted state, that, that photon moving past another electron will, will cause it to also, uh, it decay, also decay to its ground state, leaving another, producing another photon with very similar properties to the photon that moved past. And so instead of just having one photon, you have now two and then four and then eight and so on. And so these photons are moving in the same direction, they have the same energy, and they're in phase. They have the same... Uh, they're, have the same uh, amplitude as a function of time. Okay, so if you give a talk like this, the first thing you do is type the big la biggest laser into the internet, and once you've moved past the popular culture, <laughs> then you get to you get to the National Ignition <coughs> Facility, um, which is using a group of lasers to uh, to generate uh, try and generate. In the, in the lab, uh, hydrogen fusion okay, for, en for energy production. So this is two million joules in two billionths of a second once per day. So that's a lot of energy in a small spot in not very much time, and it can you know generate uh, fusion. If, if that's the, that's the goal. But this is this is ten milliwatts, um, which if well this would be ten of these like ten of these lasers uh, obeying the New South Wales limits. So, but this is this is the sort of power that this thing is generating, time averaged. So, an astronomer would say, well, that's another laser. These lasers which are uh, being used for laser guide stars are, are giving you 12 uh, watts continuous. And so that's about 10,000 of these laser pointers. So, so that, that laser shooting up into the sky out of the telescope is not something... It's not been photoshopped in there, that's, that's sodium atoms fluorescing as the laser. Uh, moves past. So this is a, a picture of that. These are not, not small machines. So, just to close the loop then on this story, I started with this picture of the galactic center. And so, so that movie I was showing is it's not the actual photos, it's, it's taking this, trying extracting the positions of the stars from images like this, and then reconstructing what what the orbits of those stars look like. With now with adaptive optics and but with the next generation where you have many guide stars, you can start to get a, an image that looks so these are simulated because this is not implemented yet. But these are starting to look like those movies where you can really see the individual stars. And then this is what uh, people would love to see with the giant Magellan telescopes, the 30 meter diameter telescopes with their very fine resolution, seeing this really seeing these individual small uh, faint stars in the galactic centre and probing 
in detail what's going on with this black hole. Okay, so that's our galaxy. Um, it's, one of, it's one galaxy of, of many. Uh, and are the black holes in other galaxies? This is the obvious question to ask. And in other galaxies, you can't study individual stars and look at their orbits. They're even, you know, no matter what adaptive optics you have. But what you can do is look at the velocities of stars as an aggregate. So if you have a, if you look at the spectrum of stars, they, though they're flux as a function of wavelength, then they have regions of the spectrum where the photons are, are absorbed by gases in the outer atmosphere, they're called absorption lines. And so if your star's moving towards you, those absorption lines will look a bit bluer than they, uh, than they are intrinsically, and if they're moving away from you, they'll look a bit redder. And so these lines will move around in the spectrum. If you're looking at a large number of stars and they have random velocities, then the effect, net effect of this is to take an absorption line which is quite narrow and make it wider. And so what's shown here is, is spectrum. It's flux as a function of wavelength. And these are absorption lines which have been broadened by, by this motions, net motions of a lot of stars moving in random directions now, not in a disk, like in the Milky Way. And here's an uh, example from close in, and here's an example from far away, from the centre of this galaxy. And what you can sort of see, even by eye, is that these lines are not as wide as these ones. And this is telling you that the stars here are moving much more rapidly than they are here. So, by looking at, at these sorts of data, you can, <clears throat> you can see that, you start to see that stars have a dramatic increase in, in speed as you move towards the centre of the galaxy. This is the galaxy M87, so far away, like 10 arc seconds away, uh, they're moving sort of at the same speed, but as you go close in, they start they move, rise very rapidly. And this is again this Keplerian rotation, as you move closer in to a point mass body like a black hole or a star, then this velocity rises very rapidly. But this scale is very small. Okay, if you're limited by the atmosphere, you can only see into an arc second or so, even at the best sites in the world. So if you want to probe these inner regions of these galaxies, you really need, again, this laser guide star adapted optics. There's no bright star close enough to M87 to do this experiment without the guide star. <coughs> it turns out that black holes are at the centres of all large galaxies, where we can, which are close enough to look. And the black hole masses uh, scale quite closely with the masses of the galaxies in which they sit. And this is something, so this is mass of the black hole, and the velocity with which stars move at large distances, this is like the mass of the galaxy. And there's this type, it's type correlation for astronomy. But this is not understood, and it's a real clue as to how the big black holes form, and how, and how they interact with the galaxies in which they sit. But the origin of this is not, not yet understood. It's one of the big mysteries. So these are galaxies near us. Um, if we look further into the universe, we see things called quasars. Um, quasars are, are very bright objects, extremely bright, but they vary rapidly in time. So we know that they're, they're, they're emitting from regions smaller than a solar system. So you have something with more light than, than an entire galaxy, but emitting from a region smaller than the solar system. And the only mechanism that's, that's known uh, that can produce this energy in such a small volume is, is accretion of material onto a black hole, where the, the energy that comes out is the release of gravitational energy for, of the material falling in, effectively through uh, heating, heat of the, heating up the material. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey is a, a survey that was done of the of about a quarter of the sky in the Northern Hemisphere, and it found hundreds of thousands of quasars and really mapped their evolution in detail. And if you, if you take, if Einstein tells us that mass and energy are equivalent, so if you're taking material and accreting it into the black hole but producing energy, then you can add up all of the light from all of the quasars and calculate how much mass had to fall into the black holes to produce this. And when you do that calculation, you find that the amount of mass you need is the same as the amount of mass that you see in all of the black holes locally. So when you look at black holes in the middle of our galaxy and nearby galaxies, what you're seeing is the remnants of these incredible objects, the quasars, uh, which existed 
um, most of the, through most of the history of the universe. Now in these objects, we see them in optical light. We also see them in, in microwaves uh, through maze emission. So here, this is a, in, the, in the centers of these galaxies near the black hole, you have material which is uh, molecular, with a lot of stars forming with molecular material. And this material in the, in the dense, illuminated environment can get into a, pop, a, a situation where it has a population inversion and, and, and maze. So it produces uh, this coherent and beamed emission at a characteristic frequency. And these sources are very strong, um, and astronomers use them to, to study, to identify chemicals that are going into star formation um, and try and understand how stars form. But they also can be used to look at the environments near the black hole. So, if I, if I have a black hole at the centre, I have material in orbit around the black hole, just as the stars are in the centre of our galaxy. But if, I have, but if I have gas there, then the gas will also uh, orbit, and it will be in a disk. Now, if, this, if I look at gas which is at, on the end, this gas is orbiting in this, this direction, according to the arrows, okay? Now, if I look at the gas here, Photon, which if I have a population inversion, I have one photon moving towards the observer, it'll move past another uh, electron in the upper, in the uh, high energy state and produce more pho another photon and they'll continue producing photons. And in this edge of the disk, all of the material is moving at the same speed. And I can see a, I see an amplified maser beamed towards the observer in this direction. If I'm over here, I don't see that because the light coming in this direction is seeing material over here which is falling, at, falling in at a different speed. And so, so the photon is not of the same energy as the, as the difference between the ground state and the upper state. So I see, but, so what I see is a series of little points of light, like maze, they're mazes pointing at the observer and they're all in this perpendicular plane. So here's a galaxy, NGC 4258. And this is now 10,000 light years, okay? so very large compared to the scales of, of 10 light days that we were talking about for the black hole in our own galaxy. But in the middle of this galaxy are ma is mazes. And you can see these are in the radio. They observe with something called very long baseline interferometry. But now we're talking about 0.5 light years out of this 10,000. And here's, these are these little spots of emission. And you can measure their velocity because the maser emission comes out at a particular speed, and so the line is, is Doppler shifted, it changes colour. And I can plot velocity as a function of distance from this, from this putative black hole, and just as I see in the solar system with this Keplerian motion, things move, planets moving faster, closer to the sun, I can trace out these curves in kilometres per second, owing to the... Uh, owing to the the, the, the maze is getting close to the black hole, orbiting faster. Okay. And again, we're looking at this very small scale, a millionth of a degree, to get down to this. But you can see this is very fast, 1,500 kilometers per second for this material. And given this, this scale, um, the black hole at the center of this galaxy must be a billion solar masses, so it's a thousand times as big as, as the, uh, the black hole at the center of our galaxy. This, this object, um, this is a water maser, and this, is, this has credentials as the coolest object in the universe. So this is a, this is a, a foreground galaxy here in the optical, and it sits at the middle here. And what you're looking at is four images of a water maser, so a, at, um, which have been gravitationally lensed. So there's a background galaxy which has a maser in it, and that maser's happens to lie along the line of sight to this foreground galaxy. And, and if you have a very heavy mass like a galaxy, light will actually bend around it. It's deflected by the gravitational field. And if the alignment's very good, you can see multiple images of the same thing. So this is a maser halfway across the universe, um, which is being gravitationally lensed by this foreground galaxy. So these masers, this is like 10 to the 30 watts. Okay, so if we're talking about big lasers, that is very bright. So,
quasars and black holes. So we think that the, that the black holes are the remnants of a quasar population. And so we'd like to understand how the black holes came to be. Everything we know about the formation of galaxies and, and the universe fits inside this, this basic picture we have of, of structure forming from a very even universe, very smooth universe that existed about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, which under gravitational collapse ended up looking with a universe which looks like this. So this is distance and angle on the sky, and each dot here is a galaxy. And so the galaxies in our local universe are not randomly positioned, they have this large-scale structure of, of um, sheets and filaments, and this is a natural consequence of gravitational collapse. But when you look, in, look more closely into this kind of uh, collapse of the dark matter, what you find is that small objects form first, little ones weighing millions of solar masses, and they merge more and more of them together to make bigger and bigger objects. Now if you take if we have galaxies forming with black holes in them, and then galaxies merge together, then something quite spectacular happens in the simulations. So what you're seeing here is two spiral galaxies, or the gas in two spiral galaxies, and these spiral galaxies have black holes in them. And as, as, you, as these galaxies merge, what you find in simulations is that some of the material, angular momentum is lost from the system to, to, to binary stars, and a lot of the gas ends up on very low angular momentum orbits that go, which means that they fall straight onto the black hole. If the gas falls onto the black hole, a lot of energy is released, and so material in the environment of the black holes is heated up, and this generates a wind which pushes material out of the galaxy, which is what you're seeing here. But what you're left with in the end is a system of stars and two black holes that are very close together. So where, in the what we think happens next is that gravitational radiation takes this binary and, it, and they, these, the, the black holes coalesce into a single, more massive black hole. Now we think this for two reasons. Firstly because it's predicted theoretically from general relativity, but also because although we see these merging galaxies in the universe, we don't see any binary black holes. We haven't seen a galaxy where there are two black holes close together. Now, so these black holes should be orbiting every few hours, so very, very close, and this corresponds to millihertz. And so, if we, if we have two black holes in the centre of our galaxy, uh, we would expect to see some variability on this time scale. Um, and we don't see that, so, these, so we, must have, we must have merged systems. Okay, well, the last topic I want to talk about is gravitational waves, and that these binary black holes lead directly to this. So if I have a, a black hole, or a massive body, it distorts the space-time nearby. And this is what we're seeing with the gravitational lensing. The galaxies distorted the space-time, and the photons move past, not in a straight line, but in a curved path, which means that we can see light from around both sides of this object. Now, when we... We're used to thinking of, of the, uh, the so orbits in the solar system as a gravitational force that holds the planet to the sun, and the planet is moving in some direction, and so it's, it's held by this gravitational acceleration so that it can't get away, and so it goes around in a circle. In general relativity, this is interpreted differently. If I put, the, the, if I put my star there, it distorts the space-time. And so the natural path for the planet is actually to go in this circle. If I, if I accelerate the planet, I would take it away from the solar system. But the natural path is for it to go around in orbit. So if I, it's like if I have this rubber sheet and I drop my apple on it, and then I throw a marble in at the right speed, it'll just go around in a circle like this. And that's the analogy. Okay. So if I now have two black holes on my rubber sheet, then, oh well, if I have, let's have one first. If I have one black hole and I spin it on the rubber sheet, nothing will happen to the rubber sheet. Okay, it'll just stay with this dip in it. But if I have two and I spin them around, like, a, like an egg, <coughs> then 
I, I have to get something which looks like this on the rubbish heap. Okay? It's gonna, I'm going to get ripples which move away, and, they, and these ripples will have a frequency which is twice the spinning the spin frequency of the of this binary pair of black holes. Now these ripples propagate through space according to general relativity at the speed of light. And so if I had objects which were just freely floating in space, I would see them <coughs> oscillate. They would wiggle towards each other further away as this wave went past. So if I wanted to detect this gravitational waves, that's how I would, that's how I would do it. Take two freely floating bodies and look, try and measure the distance between them change with time. That would be evidence for a gravitational wave. <coughs> so, <coughs> this is something that's, that's being attempted. It's the last scrap. It's a prediction of general relativity that hasn't yet been tested directly. It's been, uh, it's been measured indirectly uh, by looking at the orbits of, of objects, but not directly detected. So the idea is, I mentioned, is to have test masses and look for them, look for the distance between them oscillating as the gravitational wave moves past. But the challenge is immense. Um, the predicted, for an astronomical source, the prediction is that the separation should change by one factor in 10 to the minus 26 okay, as, as the gravitational wave moves past. Fortunately, things like these binary black holes are periodic, and so you can measure a large number of waves in a row and add them all together to try and improve your sensitivity, um, but you still need to get to one part in 10 to the minus 31. So, if I, so that's some, you know, 1.1% one, that 1 .1 of a proton over 4 kilometers. This is a very, a, a bit, another implausible experiment. So how can you do this? How can you measure very, uh, very small fluctuations in, in distance? And lasers provide, again, the, uh, the ideal solution for, for a couple of reasons. There's the collimation of the light, all the photons going in the same direction. A large amount of energy in, in a small uh, range of wavelength. The photons are coming out all at the same phase. And so it means you can do a, an interferometry experiment. So this is a, a schematic picture of a, a microsim morley interferometer with a laser. I have two mirrors here. And so light comes out, that's, it comes off the mirror back to this beam splitter and then it can go to the screen. I have another path which goes that way to the screen. And because the photons come out of the, the laser with the same phase, they can constructively interfere or destructively interfere at the screen depending on the relative length of the paths that the light has taken in the two arms. So the way that a gravitational wave uh, detector can, would work is by <coughs> having mirrors here and here, and this is a, a drawing of, of, of a suspension of a mirror um, which you have to isolate from all the vibrations that are going around, the trucks and so on that drive past. So a lot of work into trying to isolate this mirror to make it truly um, uh, in free fall. But if a gravitational wave changes the relative arm lengths here, then this spot will change in brightness. And so these instruments will, will set, the way, set the path lengths up so that they, the, the different arms destructively interfere and then look for the appearance of the spot, which would be a sign of a gravitational wave. Um, this is the, the most famous experiment to do this, LIGO. Um, there are two, this is in, on two sites in the United States. Um, and they're four kilometer long arms, so it's a very, very high vacuum, a very large uh, system, with a laser housed here, which is 35 watts. But these, which is a big laser, as we've seen, but, but these, the laser goes up and down the tube about a hundred times, so that you really build up a large number of photons in this, in this system, and it gives you an extra factor of a hundred in trying to measure this very small change, because uh, rather than just having the four kilometers, you get the 400 kilometers for, for an effective baseline. Um, so these, these two, Detectors in the United States are not the only detectors. Uh, more detectors. There's a test bed site in, w in Western Australia which works towards the upgrade of this of the LIGO to the next uh, generation of experiment. 
So this is, this is a diagram which, which summarizes the various limitations uh, that, the, that the LIGO experiment has, but it's demonstrating that the sweet spot for LIGO is at about uh, 100 hertz. So if a gravitational wave with that frequency is, is higher than seismic noise and it's lower than, than the limit imposed by a photon count. By photon counting, you can only have if you're you can only have a laser so powerful, and so you only have so many photons, and so you can only measure uh, a phase change of, of a certain size. And so this is the limitation up here. Now, 100 hertz is very much faster than the than the 10 to the minus 3 hertz that we talked about for the binary supermassive black holes in the centre of galaxies. And so LIGO can't be used to study, to study those. This is a, a plot of, of the different labeling, the different sort of astronomical sources of gravity waves that people have thought about. Um, there's bound to be more that they haven't thought about, but neutron stars and stellar mass black holes, these are all these small objects sit up here at 100 hertz, and this is what LIGO is looking for. These are systems that we understand. Uh, we sort of have a good idea of how many neutron star pairs there are and so on in the universe. And so we can predict with a relative certainty how much, how strong these sources will be, where they should be. And so when the next generation of LIGO comes along, we should start to see gravitational waves, and that's very exciting. But the supermassive black holes sit up here on this diagram, so they're, they're much larger amplitude waves, but they're at much lower frequencies, 10 to the minus 3 hertz. And this, this noise curve here is for something called LISA. LISA is a, um, a space-based experiment, and if you go, if you go down uh, in frequency by a factor of, of 100,000, then you have to make your arms 100,000 times larger in order to detect those those waves of much longer wavelength. So this, this is, LISA concept is three, has, is three uh, stations forming a three arm interferometer here uh, with arm lengths of five million kilometers. Here's the sun, the earth, and the moon, and this thing would trail uh, the earth in its orbit and look for gravitational waves from supermassive black holes. You'll note that there are two question marks on the date when this will be launched. <laughs> Okay, but this is a real thing that people, that NASA and, and the universities are working on. Okay, so that's, that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. Um, the universe knew about stimulated emission long before Einstein. And indeed the, the mazes that we see uh, from far across the universe uh, left, uh, in some cases billions of years ago, um, and we can detect is interesting is study the, the environments near black holes using this emission. Um, but closer to home, the lasers are now enabling the world's giant telescopes and those that we're about to build to realize their potential for taking very small angular scale images of, of, of uh, through the use of artificial guide stars. Without these, the telescopes are really limited to taking fuzzy images on, on the scale, same scale that, that much smaller telescopes can take. And so this is really crucial. Uh, technology. Um, and going away from the electromagnetic spectrum, lasers are going to enable measurement of tiny fluctuations in the, in the separation of these freely floating bodies in the gravity wave detectors to, de to find for the first time these ripples in space-time which, which we know uh, must be there if our theory of uh, general relativity is correct. And if they are there, they're going to give us a probe into the formation of black holes and their behaviour on scales that are really not accessible in any other way. And that's going to be a really exciting thing for the next decade. Thanks very much. Well, Stuart, thank you very much for that uh, beautifully linked uh, uh, talk on maze astronomy. It was some fascinating details. Uh, the highways and byways of uh, uh, galaxies, black holes, and uh, gravity waves. In general relativity, I see Einstein's hand in many places, uh, still exploring his ideas uh, in 100, more than 100 years after he laid them out. Um, sure, as indicated, we'd be happy to answer a few questions if there are some uh, uh, pressing questions.
pressing questions from the floor. Yes, gentlemen over here. Her question is, why is the Hubble Space Telescope not connected to the internet? <laughs> <laughs> um, <do you> know, <laughs> the Hubble Space Telescope was, was designed in like 1978, and the internet wasn't wasn't uh, thought about until the mid -80s, late 80s. So the Hubble Space Telescope, I don't know what the data rates are, the Hubble Space Telescope um, has a very small capacity to transmit data. Uh, it has an unbelievably uh, <coughs> flimsy computer. <laughs> um, it was almost not, it was almost designed too early to have CCD cameras on it initially. It's a very old concept. The natural mazes that you're talking about, what gives the uh, emission direction? Is it only when the, the star behind them that the um, potential point of light from that? In the case of the, in the, case of the, the, the Keplerian disk, so in, in, a, in a disk like in the solar system, the planets which are closer in move faster. So if you, <coughs> if you look at, if you, in order to have the uh, the stimulated emission, the photon needs to have the same energy relative to the next atom. So if, if it's got a different velocity, then it's Doppler shifted away from the resonance. So the only, if you're in a Keplerian disk, if you're looking at the edge of it, then all of the material is moving in the same, at the same speed along that line of sight. If you look, and that's why you can, that's why you get the amplification along that, pointing towards the observer. In that direction. If you look at other parts of the disk, you don't get that because along the line of sight to the observer, the um, the velocities are changing with distance, and so that so you don't get the amplification. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so the gravitational wave does affect the time as well. Um, the question is how, you, how to compare them. I don't think the atomic clocks are accurate enough to, for the 10 to the minus 21 uh, difference. I'm not sure if that's the only reason why that, that experiment is not tried. Um, but you have to get the clocks, you know, if you start with them some distance apart, you have to get them back together again. And that involves acceleration. So then, then the, then the time has to change as well. So I, it's a good question. Um, I, I don't think I don't think the clocks are accurate enough to detect that. I'd be very surprised. <coughs> uh, the gentleman over here. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, you mentioned, and that was mentioned last lecture as well, that lasers, uh, when they're emitted, uh, that's, well, that's actually photons emitted when electrons from a high energy state go down to a low energy state in a row of electrons. Um, I'm going to give the, the simple answer, and if it's not good enough, I'm going to hand over. So the, the property of the, one of the properties of stimulated emission, and I to be honest, I don't know why. If the, if the photon that comes from the next, so if you have you have one photon, it stimulates the emission from the next electron over, and that electron travels in the same direction. But I don't know why that is quantum mechanical. It's a good quantum mechanical reasons. It's yeah. <laughs> absolute synchronization. Right, so we, might, uh, we might call a halt to the, uh, to the questions there. Our uh, students are happy to hang around for a little longer if you've got other uh, pressing questions on uh, some of these, uh, these big, big ideas. Uh, I would like to um, uh, invite you all back uh, Just press the in the, uh, uh, for the uh, next Friday and the Friday afterwards for the uh, other two uh, lectures to go in the July lecture program. And I uh, would like you to, uh, if you're interested, you can't, uh, you haven't got enough lasers yet, even after our four July lectures, uh, during National Science Week, uh, hopefully on August the 20th, uh, we'll have Professor Hans Buckwell uh, come down from the Australian National University. Hans is one of Australia's leading uh, laser physicists uh, to give a talk on uh, lasers 50 years younger than the brilliant future, where he's promised a lot of quantum limitness. So you're going to get a detailed answer. <laughs> I'll buy them uh, for you tonight.
So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. And